Morgen, morgen. Ek gaan net so twee lijnkies in Afrikaans praat om daarom my moeder taal te, um, te eerbiedig en professor Gerwel. Baie welkom by die Suidoosterfeest en die boekebespreking um, vir die Jake's Gerwel stichting. Um, yes, well, that covers the Afrikaans that I'm going to speak today. Yeah, the prof was a linguist and I, as you know, I, I'm sure he would appreciate me switching out over to English to um, speak to um, the author that we have uh, the privilege of speaking with today, Richard Callan. Now, um, Richard is a Brit British South African Associate Professor of Public Law at UCT, um, a fellow of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and of course we all know him as an analyst and a political commentator. Um, now he, with Mabel Sitole, um, wrote this wonderful book that I had the privilege of reading um, very interesting, um, and I'll comment about that now. The other person on our panel is Lawson Naidu, who also needs no introduction. Um, the Executive Secretary of the Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution. Um, he's a role player in civil society, and he has very important views um, on, on, on South Africa, a deep understanding of the African National Congress, um, and he comes with a long list of liberation credentials. First of all, Richard, congratulations on the book. Um, I thought that the book described both the attributes, the shortcomings, um, but also the failures and successes um, in a very fair way to all four presidents in South Africa. Of course, I'm biased, I'm totally biased, um, but I appreciated the frankness with which you also looked at Madiba's presidency. The only problem um, is that, you know, the people who make the, the allegations of him being a sellout are not the people who read, right? Um, and and, and we, should, we should settle with that. Um, my comment about his presidency, just to start off with, is that um, one shouldn't lose sight, I think, that um, it was a very young organization that took over the government um, of South Africa in 1994. And, um, you know, they, they had absolutely no... Uh, under, first of all, understanding perhaps, but secondly, experience on how to run a country. So you make mention in the book of a very fragmented communication system all over the government those years. Um, do you think, and that's my first question, do you think that we've managed to resolve that in government now, if you look at where we are today? Have they managed that? It's 30 years later. Well, well, given the fiasco of the past week in relation to communications on the ICC and South Africa's position on the International Criminal Court, I think the very short and quick and easy answer is no. If anything, it's got worse. And uh, <clears throat> although the current president's spokesperson, Vincent Mangania, is a, is a very capable guy, actually I think we've, we've got weaker in terms of the ability to communicate complex positions at difficult times. Uh, and I think back to the great uh, spin doctors that uh, President Mandela had, President Mbeki had, and they really were, I think, very uh, authoritative when they spoke on behalf of their, of their principle. Um, so I fear we've, we've lost that somehow. And um, although uh, Vincent's very capable, I, I actually think he's, he's hamstrung because his president, the, the current president, who is a very, very good communicator, when he chooses to be, doesn't get out there enough, doesn't give uh, Vincent enough uh, uh, space to, to go out and communicate on his behalf and with his authority. So I think that's a, that's a, that is a weakness, a, an ongoing weakness. And it's one of the five areas we identified Mabel and I as being kind of core um, skill sets for a president. The fifth one is the ability to communicate your position, the ability to persuade people and create uh, followership. But Zelda, thank you, by the way, for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you all for very much for being here, and I apologize for being so terribly unilingual that, uh, that, uh, I, that we have to do this in, uh, just in English. No, thank you, um, Richard. We appreciate that. And when we switch over to Afrikaans, it's because we don't want you to know what we say. <laughs> Um, yes, so, so the ANC operated in, in, silo, in silos whilst they were underground um, and by slow mail for almost 15, 50 years. How long do you think it will take before we get this right? Before they, and are they able to, and maybe Lawson, you understanding the ANC so well, you can you, um, uh, um, please jump in if you, if you feel you have a better 
explanation than Richard. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but what, how long do you think this 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 is going to take? How do we fix it? Fix what? The, the, the communi communication, the lacking communication, and 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 governments communicating uh, across. Well, it should be the easiest thing to do. Uh, the, the really hard bit of government in the modern era is to is to identify, grapple with, and resolve the big strategic choices, uh, policy, <coughs> policy coordination. Those are the really hard bits of government. Figuring out who should do what, figuring out the relationship between the public and the private sector, determining how the how uh, the market should be regulated or not regulated. These are the big tough questions. Um, responding to global crises such as the geopolitical crisis created by Ukraine or climate change. These are the big difficult ones. Fixing communications is really just a technical issue. It should be the, the low-hanging fruit, to use the cliché. I don't know if it's anything to do with the ANC and the liberation movement. Perhaps Lawson can shed light on that question. I, I don't think so. I just think it's an inability to organize your... Your, your staff and your system in government so that it's better able to communicate. But Lawson, sorry, the, the, the ANC functioned well underground. They managed communication despite being banned. How are they not managing now? Well, I think you know the two, the two issues are linked because you need to have a clear strategic framework, as Richard says. You need to know what government is wanting to do, what its key plans are on key issues. And then the issue of communication becomes much simpler because the message is clear. Uh, currently, the message is, is anything but clear. And therefore, we have different cabinet ministers saying different things about the same issue, creating confusion uh, amongst the public, creating confusion in the corporate sector, amongst the international investor community, and so on. Um, so I think that's a fundamental problem. So you know, th you know, uh, in, in the 90s, in your time, you know, the strategic vision of the Mandela government was very clear. And he was able to delegate on the basis of that. Even in the Mbeki era, uh, a similar uh, uh, process followed. And the messaging, whether you agreed with it or not, is immaterial. But the messaging was, really, was clear. Now it, it, it isn't. <coughs> Coming back you know, to the ANC, particularly the ANC in exile, uh, you know, communication was different there because it was a very centralized organization. You know, everything fed up into, uh, into certain structures who spoke on behalf of, of, of the movement. Primarily, uh, President Oliver Tambo was, you know, the official uh, mouthpiece of the ANC. And others, you know, spoke around him, but the messaging was always consistent. And I think that's, that's really the, the problem we have now. And, and if I can add, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And, and if I can add one small point, it does go to leadership and leadership authority. I suspect in your day, cabinet ministers would have been very careful to make sure they knew the line, understood the strategic choices before they said anything. Now it's it's kind of um, it's open season, and and it goes to the authority of the president or lack thereof, to be perfectly honest. And I think good governments have to be very disciplined about this. And if I draw an analogy from from Britain, you know, when the when the Blair government came in it was very determined that it wouldn't fall into the trap of previous Labour governments of being very, of, of washing its dirty linen in public. And so the great figure of Alistair Campbell emerged as this very demonic, almost uh, authoritarian kind of comms person at the centre of government. And his job was to instill discipline in government so that there were not mixed messages, so there was not confusion. Now, every government needs an Alistair Campbell, just as every government probably needs an Aesop, perhaps, or, or at least a very skilled Parks Makinlana, someone like that, you know, Parks from your day. Very skillful, authoritative spokesperson, trusted by the principal, trusted by the press. That's true. Um, with reference to the Mbeki era, you talk about that's where the obsession with in the intelligence um, uh, um, uh, um, structure started. Do you think that perhaps it's as a result of him having to operate underground um, that this almost paranoia kind of developed? Well, I think Mbeki understood probably better than anyone just how complex and potentially uh, ill-disciplined his own organization uh, was, is, and, and the same of the country. Uh, and he, I think, understood the, the perils that lay ahead if you were not sufficiently 
au fait with, with the landscape, if you didn't understand the threats and the risks. So I think he was very conscious of the need for a, a modern government to be well equipped in that regard. You know, we all have, I suppose, difficult relationships with spies and intelligence, but actually good intelligence is critical to good democratic government because a good democratic government can and should be able to assess the risks that lie ahead. And if people are doing anti-democratic things, and I'm thinking here now of the July 2021 unrest, which was in many ways a failure of intelligence. It was a failure uh, to gather the information, understand the threat, and, and address it and anticipate it. So I think good modern governments and good uh, presidents recognize this and, and have at their disposal a well-organized, well-qualified intelligence um, sector. Of course, Mbeki developed this really interesting little unit called the Presidential Support Unit, which sounded like a group of typists or secretaries, but in fact was five very skilled, high-level intelligence operatives who he, um, uh, he organized as a special unit reporting directly to him in the presidency. Presumably, he he didn't trust the National Intelligence Services, or at least he wanted a second opinion. And he had them flying around the world and flying around the country, gathering information, reporting to him, so that he as president could make better decisions about the threats, risks, and opportunities that presented themselves. Then you look at today and the whole Pala Pala uh, issue playing out. But that's where it started. This, you know, the the how um, the intelligence sector was really um, uh, uh, misused. I would say, you know, to to um, to be used against your political opponent. Um, so we see this whole pala pala thing happening. But now President Mbeki has be become the voice of reason in pala pala. Um, is that very fair of him? Does he does he realize, you know, that he has to look back at how this all started? Is it? Why do you look um, at each other? <laughs> no, it's a, well, it's a very interesting and, and not easy question to answer. I, I, I think, you know, Mbeki, as always, is a complicated character. And, and often, with regards to him, for every good question, there's at least two good answers, if you know what I mean. So, so he's quite contradictory at times. And intelligence is perhaps a good example of that. I've just described how I think he understood how you needed good intelligence services, but he did, I think, start the process of factionalizing parts of the government system to serve <coughs> factional agendas. And that was, if, if that's true as a proposition, a general proposition, then that set in chain uh, a whole series of, of consequences in terms of what happened next, what Zuma did to government, how he hollowed out government, how he basically reorientated government to serve his agenda, his personal agenda, and that of his cronies and, and family and so on. So that was therefore a bad uh, judgment call on Mbeki's and, and, and poor decision making. Uh, and of course now he, he now presents, as you say, Zelda, uh, himself as the voice of, of uh, sagacity, sagacity and reason, um, which does come across as a bit rich. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, but on the other hand, as we say in our book, here was a president for, for who, who actually understood, I think, strategy and who made tough strategic choices, whether you agreed with them or not, whether they were the right decision or not. He did have the courage to make strategic choices, whether it was the shift from RDP to gear, or his choices on, on foreign policy, uh, his vision uh, in terms of Africa and nascence. These were big strategic um, uh, choices, and we've been short of those ever since. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, you know, on that, and, and in Becky's recent comments, I mean, I think, Two, two, two points I want to make. Uh, firstly, things have gotten so bad that you know Mbeki has sort of studiously avoided trying to comment on his successes as president. But I think he's felt that the time has come that he cannot keep quiet anymore. But in in doing so, uh, you know he's he's exposed himself because this. And for me, the issue is around the importance of parliament, and and the denigration and and marginalisation of parliament started in the Mbeki era, where it was, you know, a very, very strong presidency, uh, didn't, you know, um, pay uh, as much attention to parliament as it should have done. Uh, and, you know, this was, for me, uh, a, a stark difference between the M Mandela presidency and, and subsequent ones. Um, you will recall, and uh, I worked at parliament in that first parliament from 94, and the one thing that, that Mandela did was 
he gave due recognition to the importance of that institution. And I even remember your predecessor, Mary, um, would always call me and say, uh, the president is going to be coming to the National Assembly today. And I would then go and report to my boss, Freni Janwala, to say, the president's coming. And she says, why is he telling me he's entitled to come? But it was his respect for the institution that for him, it was important for the speaker to know that he was going to come there. Not to speak, he would come there, listen to the debates and make notes. That's the respect that he had for the institution. And I think that's something that we've lost and, haven't, and we need to regain. But it's interesting that during the Mbeki era now, I can't remember, Richard, whether you mentioned the email saga. Um, that happened during the, the Mbeki era where this, there was these emails with Khalema, involving Khalema, if I'm not, if not, I'm not uh, if I recall right. Um, and this, the second thing was, um, you know, the plot to oust him. That started whilst he had this third, uh, uh, um, I don't want to use the word force, but this, 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 uh, the five people in this, in the support group, as you, as you say. Um, so, you know, it, yes, surely you must see, you know, that um, there's this paranoia um, that's reflected in the public domain and that people, are concerned about even today because now I question having, after um, you know reading this I now question what why are you now the voice of uh, of Paula Paula um, when this, there was the email saga and there was the the plot against you um, these things are all just um, you know make believe stories sorry yeah it's an interesting feature of leadership it's whether leaders can be strong enough to keep their most serious rivals close and part of the team, or whether they feel so insecure that they need to push their rivals out. Maybe it's a feature of politics that because you need to, because it's competitive, because you need to control power sufficiently to get things done, that there is a general tendency to push your rivals away. Because if they're too close and they've got too much air time and oxygen, they may uh, push you out. I think Mbeki took that to an extreme. I mean, what happened in, was it 2001? I think we deal with this in the book. The uh, clearly spurious, in my view, uh, and cynically spurious allegations that Tokyo and Matthew Poza and, and Cyril were part of a plot against, uh, against Mbeki. Um, and that, that was then used to push them out into Siberia or at least in Cyril's case, out into uh, extremely um, comfortable uh, economic and commercial opportunities. So it was a pretty soft landing. But the fact was he, they were pushed away. And, and I think one of the problems we've had, and maybe lost in comment on whether this is a feature of ANC politics or not, is the inability to build successorship, to, to groom a, a next generation of leaders. Clearly the ANC, one of its major problems at the moment is that it hasn't done that. So it's, there's, a, there's a massive gap now beneath the current generation of leaders, and it's very difficult to project a, a party with a future if you don't have a, a group of next-gen leaders, so to speak. So it's one of the things that makes them look like they're tired and have run out of runway. That's a real problem for them. No, it's, <coughs> it is uh, particularly uh, you know, noticeable at the moment. Uh, but then if you go back, you know, uh, to the exile years, for example, uh, I mean, you had Oliver Tambo as president of the ANC for 30 years. It was, you know, uh, due to the circumstances at the time. But there was uh, 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 um, a level of leadership within the National Executive Committee comprising of people like, like Tabo, uh, Chris Harney, and others. Uh, there was a, a level of, of committed, capable leaders uh, who were supportive of, of him. And, you know, those leaders subsequently rose into the ranks of government uh, later on. So you could see that development that happened. You know, and there was a level of, of development of, of cadence, to use the word, uh, in that time, which you don't, I don't see now. If you, know, if you look beyond the people that are there and you think, well, where are the younger leaders? There's probably three or four we could name. But it's, it's very, very few. But yet they have a political school now. Okay. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, a very, it's very thin, yes. to say the least. Um, Richard, you, you write about um, people 
arriving at a president's door and talking and, and, and telling stories. Um, I remember on countless occasions um, and how bored I was whenever um, President Jacob Zuma, before he became president, would arrive at Madiba's doorstep and have these stories, hour-long conversations of these stories, sometimes very boring. But Madiba had a very good intuition to know what to believe and what not. That is a very important thing for a president to have, to have that intuition and that, uh, um, you know, that, that fine-tuning um, who to believe and who not, because you are overwhelmed as a president with this information and gossip that come to you. I remember specifically with the, um, the Jackie Celebi um, 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 case, how different people came and provided different stories. Um, who else in South Africa from these, uh, from the four president, Madiba excluded, of course, now the others, who has this intuition? Does anyone have this kind of intuition? And do you see it in a new leadership or not at all? Well, it is partly intuition in the end because, uh, and, and this would, is our third in our five sort of categories of, of core skills, is decision-making, judgment. And, and if nothing else, the head of a government has to have good judgment, whether it's selecting a cabinet or making a political choice faced by a crisis. It's the judgment that they really, is where they earn their money, as it were. Um, so there is intuition, but this is one person, flesh and blood, 24 hours a, in a day. So. Any successful president has to rely heavily on the people around them, their close staff. And the quality of those people is, in many ways, as important as any other consideration. If they have weak people, then it's a major problem. And so uh, one can look at all of these five presidents and, and look through the lens of their immediate advisors, and you can learn a, a great deal from that. You need people who can be the eyes and ears of the president. You need people who can communicate, as we've discussed already, the, the president's vision. You need people who can get stun, stuff done on behalf of the president, be an enforcer, the muscle man who goes out there and, and provides that political muscle. Because the president can't be everywhere all of the time. Um, so that's the, that's the challenge. And uh, I think that when it comes to filtering the, the, the stuff of politics, you need those filters in those people. In the book, we, we have a wonderful story from Trevor Manuel about uh, Zuma, um, about how he was summoned to uh, the presidential uh, office in uh, Pretoria. And he arrived, and he was made to wait for an hour and a half. And during that hour and a half, Trevor describes how all manner of people came and went and how he knew none of them. They were, they were mysterious people coming and going, seeing President Zuma. And that was very instructive to him because he thought these are not the people I would expect to be coming and going, officials, other political leaders, and so on. They were the deal makers. They were the, the shadowy network that Zuma had created. And when finally Manuel was summoned, Zuma said to him, I'm sorry, I'm too tired now for the conversation. And they didn't have it. You know, that was, that's just a small anecdote to illustrate the extent to which Zuma, you know, took government off book and, and, and treated it as his own kind of plaything to the exclusion of the serious business of government. So that's not quite what you're asking me, but it indicates the, the character of a presidency, how a president chooses to use his power or her power, and how he organizes his presidency in a way that serves the public interest as opposed to the private interests of a particular leader. Because the president is only as good as those he surround himself with, right? And I think Madiba did a great job, not, uh, of, not with me, but that's where he, you know, he made a mistake. Um, but, but specifically with um, Professor Finkhuis, um, Professor Jake Scharvel, um, Tony True Parks, Joel Nechetenji. I mean, that was his close circle of people, and they are all... Um, people of great character, integrity, and, 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 and that filters through, as you said earlier, to, to, um, to the to government. But now, let's go back, come back to 2023. Um, you know, the current president, Ramaphosa, um, is surrounded sometimes with people, uh, you know, have, who have been convicted of fraud. Um, you have uh, Wali Ruede, um, and ben, Benjani Chauke. Um, Surely the president, Cyril Ramaphosa, should realize that his strength lies in those around him 
Um, is he is he aware of it? Do you think he thinks about these things or? <laughs> well, he's a, he's a capable guy. He's an intelligent guy. Totally. So I think I'm sure he does think about these things. Um, I mean, you've mentioned some of the the more roguish characters around him. Uh, I think on the other side of the balance sheet, there are some very good, decent, capable people. But um, it's it's this is a very um, clumsy way of putting it. But you know that old saying about how people and their dogs end up looking like each other. Is it? You remember that thing? I don't know which way around it is. I've, the, I've got fringe wh- bulldogs, thanks. Pers- <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful breed. Um, absolutely delightful breed. Um, anyway, so it's clumsy, as I say. So let, let, what I'm trying to say is that um, it's important to avoid groupthink in presidency. And, and we talk about groupthink as absolutely. a psychosis. The great presidents of history have around them strong characters who are not af- afraid to say, you're wrong, boss. Think again. I think your president had those people. They had, they, despite the fact that this was the saintly figure of Mandela, they were strong enough. And independent. And independent enough. And he encouraged, more importantly, them to have that independence and to not be frightened to say no. I think the good guys around Cyril don't have that. I, I don't think they're different enough to him. I think they're too much of an extension of him. So they fall into the same tempo of sl- decision making, the same character of decision making. And, and uh, they're too similar in outlook to, to their boss. And that's one of the problems I think he faces. Plus, he just doesn't have the, the uh, intellectual uh, muscle of a Joel Nechitenzi or the political muscle, muscle of an Esop Pahad. Mm. You know, you, you need those kinds of hefty characters in a presidency if you really want to be an effective leader. Because, you know, just to add to that, I think what you see is because they're not strong enough, they, their advice tends to be tend towards what do I think the president wants to hear mm. rather than what he should hear. But that that, from, that, that for me is a fundamental. time, right? That's exactly the point I was going to come to. Is because it's happened uh, from Mbeki's time. It, because you know Mbeki was such a forceful person. He put it out there, and people were afraid to take him on. Mm. Uh, there were one or two people in cabinet who did. Uh, the late Professor Kada Asmal being one of them, who was not afraid to uh, you know to to debate with Tabo. But many of the other members of cab- uh, of cabinet. Uh, simply didn't have the intellectual ability to be able to do that. Richard, you talk about, um, you know, that Madiba, or I think it's Khalema that says Madiba should have had an office in the ANC because that would have um, avoided the situation where you find um, there's this fragmented ANC that we sit with today. Um, but we also all know about how Madiba um, <laughs> kind of irritated the space around Becky, you know, and his staff took action, but the, exactly what you're saying, Lawson. People thought that they would do certain things to um, uh, to, to give reason to um, uh, Mr. Mbeki's irritations about Madiba. Um, yet they weren't always justified, and Mr. Mbeki didn't know about many of these things. And then Halema says we should have had Madiba in the ANC office, but Madiba was made, uh, was, was, um, made to believe that he was no longer almost welcome in meetings because, um, you know, there was a very hostile environment towards him. What what would, do you think would have been the better solution? A fragmented ANC or uh, Mr. Mbeki irritated with Madiba and, you know, there's all these inconveniences then that, that happen, um, you know, making Ma- Ma- Madiba's life absolute, very difficult? Well, let me start. I mean, I think a lot of that had to do with the contestation for power within the ANC. And people wanted Madiba out of the picture so that he wouldn't be able to influence that. Uh, And, you know, the the stories are well known about what Madiba's preferences might have been uh, in that regard. So it was very, it was a clear strategy to keep him out of internal ANC politics so that the succession battle could play out without his influence. Um, it was perhaps, a, you know, with hindsight again, and you know, you make the point in the book is that we mustn't look at these things through the prism of hindsight because mm. it's far too easy. You've got to understand the conditions at the time. Um, you know, and uh, one can understand, um, and those of us who lived through it at the time, it was very easy to understand why Madiba did what he did. He, he saw his role as, well, 
We've delivered an ANC government. We have delivered uh, a democracy. It's now, it, it was part of his process of exiting the political stage, that the ANC must be able to continue after him and his influence should not, uh, you know, uh, should not linger. Um, and, you know, it made perfect sense at the time. Um, but yeah, we can quibble with that now. Um, Richard, you're right that Madiba created the stability in South Africa for us to have a peaceful transition, right? Then Thabo Mbeki created an economic climate to rebuild the economy of South Africa. During um, President Zuma's time, his presidency benefited from the gains of the previous two uh, um, presidents. When people now say things were better during the Zuma era, it is in effect because of the gains made before the, Z the Zuma era, right? Then you state that um, Cyril Ramaphosa is again tasked with stability. But at what point do we only focus on socioeconomic issues? And um, we, 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 the, we run the risk of just repeating um, the same mistakes of the past because the only focus right now should be um, socioeconomic issues. Well, Mbeki coined the expression of the two nations. So I think he understood very well the the, the, the socioeconomic landscape, the issues of social justice, and also the risks that having such a divided country uh, created. And so his, I think his whole game plan was, whether you agree with it or not, to, to address that. And he did have a game plan to address it. And those years, and it was partly because he was lucky with the global economic climate of the, the period of the 2000s, but that period was uh, a period of relative stability and, and uh, solid growth uh, with, with essentially good institutions. So it was a, it's easy to look back now and say that was a golden period. Businesses at the time, I remember talking to businesses and, and for a while they were very worried by Mbeki because they didn't understand him and he sometimes said things that they found threatening. But, but in general, they came to the view, well, we don't need to understand this guy because things are going quite nicely actually. You know, it's good for business. Um, and then, of course, uh, 2008, there was the global economic uh, financial crisis, and it, Zuma takes over just after that, a year later, 2009. And his government faces severe headwinds because of that. And you're right, Zelda, I think the fact that, although the, the economy shed about a million jobs because of it, in general, South Africa was able to absorb that crisis because of the good work of previous administrations. You know, there was a budget deficit to fall back on, there were strong institutions, capital markets were well regulated, the banking sector and so on. All of those things have been put in place during the first uh, 15 years of democracy. So that was a sturdy base to withstand those kinds of pressures. What Zuma then did was dismantle much of that over the, the subsequent nine years. So what uh, Ramaphosa inherited, and this is why it's difficult to uh, be fair to Cyril, because on the one hand, his, his weaknesses are now obvious, and his failures to get stuff done are so obvious. On the other hand, one has to balance that with what he inherited, and, and the, the uphill challenge he's faced to, to re, uh, rebuild broken institutions and rebuild confidence in the economy. Very, very difficult task. When I was first introduced to the Freedom Charter in 1994, I thought it's the most beautiful document that I've ever um, read in my life. Um, I was still gifted a copy of the Freedom Charter um, by um, um, Uncle Kathy. And Khalima says in the interview for your book, he says that he was very aware during his deputy presidency and his presidency how far the ANC was moving away from the ideals of the Freedom Charter. Um, do you think, um, is the document still important to the ANC today? Um, a, a difficult question. I mean, I think uh, at times, as a matter of convenience, it gets hauled out uh, to, to show that the ANC is true to its, its roots and its values and principles. Um, but if you look, you know, scratch beneath that surface and look at exactly what the ANC is doing and saying, particularly what it's doing and saying in government, it's, it's uh, far removed from the ideals of the Freedom Charter. So it becomes one of these things of, um, you know, pretty much like the Constitution is now becoming, as a political football, as a, 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 a document that is, is contested, uh, you know, and there's been debates, 
you know, from the day the Freedom Charter was adopted as to exactly what does it mean. Because, you know, the principles are clear. But then if you take those principles and say, well, what does that mean in practice in terms of policy, legislation, and so on, you all have different interpretations of it, particularly, you know, in the debate now around nationalization, um, land issues, and so on. So it, it's become highly contested. And, you know, uh, so it's, it's not, you know, I mean, speaking personally, I mean, what attracted me to the liberation movement was the Freedom Charter. Uh, was because, you know, it's an, an incredible document. Um, highly aspirational, values-driven, principles-driven. Um, and, you know, you've got to move on from that. Has the ANC been able to articulate uh, an economic and social strategy based on those fundamental principles? And I think that's where the divergence occurs between values and principles on the, on the one hand and what's convenient on the other. Thank you, Lawson. Um, Richard, I really enjoyed your um, brief um, assessment of Khalema's presidency because he was in power only for eight months. Um, do we need a Khalema Mutlante to take us forward? Is he not? Um, do you think he'll, he'll, he'll um, step back into the political field? Um, is it over for him? Isn't he what we need? Because, I mean, he is the person that's um, opposing cadre deployment the way it's been implemented now. Um, after the commission that lo looked into um, land restitution, he was the person that said the constitution provides for this. It's the implementation that's not not working. Is he a lone voice? Um, or I I but is that not the type of person that we need as a president now? Uh, it's tempting to, to reach that conclusion because he seems such a measured, dignified, uh, and reasoned and reasonable character. Uh, and certainly his nine months in government uh, matched all of those attributes. He, he, in, in the, the difficulty, of course, is nine months is a, a very short period of time to be in power on which to base any real assessment of him. So it's, it's perhaps a mistake to assume that because he seemed so good in those nine months that he would have been good for nine years. Because government is very difficult. And, and government in a country like South Africa is even more difficult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the old aphorism is that there's only two ways out of politics, which is death and failure. Um, it indicates how perilous political leadership at that highest level is. You tend to confront some sort of failure or crisis sooner rather than later. So we don't really know how uh, good he would have been faced by those kinds of really severe predicaments that an administration will face. But I think as, a, as an exemplar of good leadership, yes, there is a huge amount to be learned from him, from his, his calmness, his resoluteness, his sense of principle, all of those things, his values. I, I, I wish we could have more of that, certainly. Um, has, his, has he... Has he still got uh, legs to, to play that role? I, I rather doubt. I, I think that uh, the politics of the ANC these days are so rugged, uh, so brutal, uh, and so far removed from the ANC that he knew. In his really wonderful interview that he gave us in the book, he really speaks of that. He speaks of his lament about the state of the ANC, and he recognizes that something that uh, we, we understood, but which he really brought our attention to, that for, an ANC, for, for a president in South Africa during the last 30 years, the re president's relationship with the ANC was as important as how he governed. Because how you manage the ANC, as we've seen in different ways over the last three decades, has a huge bearing on, on how you lead the country. And it's a really difficult task, actually. Um, none of them have really got it quite right, probably because it's a wicked problem and you can't get it quite right. It's, it's beyond perfection. But, but they've all in many ways tripped up over their relationship with the ANC. I mean, Ramaphosa, uh, people said to us on record, you know, he doesn't really understand the ANC, even though he's held all these positions in the ANC. He, he, he doesn't really quite get it and he, and he struggles with it. Zuma, of course, fully understood the ANC, invested a lot of time in the ANC to make sure that it, he had it fully under control because that's your power base. Mm -hmm. That really is your power base. And that's why he was able to survive so long because he'd controlled that. But even he, Zuma, so skillful at that, in the end was brought down by his own party. And it's such an interesting thing, is it not, that 
Uh, we've had three decades of democracy. We've had one party in government winning no less than 57% of the vote on every single one of the six national elections. And yet we've actually not had a single president uh, serve a full term. And given the history of post-colonial, uh, post-democratic Africa, where people have tended to outstay their welcome in government and hang on to power, what's, it's really quite extraordinary that none of these five, for different reasons, have served a full term. Yet, Ramaphosa could break that trend and serve uh, two full terms, but I've got a sneaking suspicion he won't. Can I uh, just make a point about uh, Khalema? Um, you know, I think uh, it, it, it epitomizes the, the problem that we spoke about earlier in the ANC of the lack of cadre development. Where are the next generation of leaders coming from? And because we don't have an answer to that, we fall back on people like Khalema as the savior, uh, both for the ANC and for the country. Um, and in many respects, it's, it's obvious why we do that, because he is, I think, of the post-Mandela presidents, the one that most closely uh, lives up to the legacy of Mandela, his, you know, his calm demeanor, his thoughtfulness, uh, his integrity, uh, just the way he comes across, uh, you know, very measured. And, and, you know, I think the country is calling out for that kind of leader, of uh, a sober, stable leader that can give a clear, simple vision. And I think that's what we're harking to when we start to talk about people like Halema. So in both your views, who is that next person then? Am I putting you on the spot to ask that? Is there anyone that you could, um, that you'd like to predict maybe, where this person, uh, someone that could lead into that? Um, is there anyone with that type of character? Well, let me start. Um, Look, I think if we look l across the spectrum, there is a crisis of leadership in South Africa. Across the world, right? Ac across the world, but uh, focusing just on, on us for the moment. Uh, and it's not just a crisis of political leadership, it's a crisis of leadership across the country mm. in, in different sectors. Mm. Um, so where, so it's not one person that we should be looking for, but you know, what is this new, uh, the new, you know, a new interpretation of the value system of where we are now in 2023, that's going to take us forward. Uh, and I think that's something that we're grappling with as, as a society. So, you know, who the next president of the ANC might be is maybe part of that equation. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that's very clear is that the ANC is not as, uh, as dominant a force today as it was 30 years ago. Yes, and I, uh, the final line of our book, I think, captures this point that South Africa is going to have to prosper um, despite its political mm. leadership and its presidents rather than because of. Mm. I, I don't see um, a savior on the horizon, mm. so therefore we're going to have to save ourselves. Um, that doesn't mean I agree with what Ramaphosa was quoted as saying this week, where he basically said, it's over to you guys. Uh, he said something along the lines of, um, the solutions are going to have to be found by South Africans, kind of saying, I've given up. <laughs> uh, my administration can't solve the problems. You lot are going to have to do it. Now, that's a terrible abrogation of responsibility for a government. Should never, the president should never say such a thing, in my view. But the truth is, yes, the, the solutions, the leadership is going to have to come from, from the rest of society. The political leadership is not going to provide it. Mm -hmm. Now, that actually I see as a source of of optimism, because this country is so well endowed with, with human capital. There is such rich skills in this country. I see it every day. Um, often, unfortunately, it's in the private sector, not the public sector. So there's been a, over 10 or 15 years, there's been a huge shift of, of talented, particularly younger people, going only into the private sector, not being drawn into politics or into government. So there's a very great imbalance there, which is harmful. But there, there's huge skills and, and talent mm. in the private sector, in civil society, uh, and so on. And that, that is encouraging. Many societies don't have that. And so we, that's, for me, the, the greatest cause of optimism. So that leadership will have to come from people in those sectors, uh, standing up, getting things done, stepping into the, to the gaps that the, the government or the state, uh, unfortunately, has created. I must tell you that um, the, this book is, is, is full of very insightful 
um, interviews and and um, um, uh, examples of good leadership and what constitutes um, good leadership. Um, but there's one line in the book that really made me laugh out, li out, out, li out loud. And you can't believe that a serious book like this can actually make you laugh. And I want to read this line to you. Um, so he's dealing with, or they're dealing with uh, President Zuma or President Mbeki era. And then this line says, but then Zuma's legal challenges went away and he became the new president. And I laughed. <laughs> Um, that what that didn't last long. Do you think they will be? Do you think um, President Zuma will stand trial? What do you think, Lars? <laughs> well, the simple answer is yes, because he is standing trial at the moment. I mean, the case may not be proceeding in the Peter Maritzburg High Court because of all his, uh, you know, uh, side issues about wanting to remove the prosecutor and, and so on. Um, but he's been charged with, um, you know, 783 counts of fraud and corruption. And he is technically in court facing those charges. Yes, yes. But is it ever going to actually appear before court? Is there going to be a court case? We are, I mean, is that, uh, South Africans are waiting for that. Yeah, and it's an, it's an interesting point because um, Zuma, the irony, the great irony of Zuma is this person who, when it suits him, attacks the judiciary, attacks the rule of law has been the greatest beneficiary of the strength of our rule of law and the independence of our judiciary. Mm -hmm. He's used that system um, in order to protect himself by taking every legal point, filibustering legally, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Um, and he will continue to do so, obviously, because that's his, his grand so-called Stalingrad strategy. But actually what, what the court system at some point has to do, and this is a, a feature of a good justice system, is that justice delayed is justice denied, as we know. And there'll have to be a point where the, the legal system is able to, to penetrate that strategy and say, now is the time for you to face trial in, in the final sense of that, and, and to actually, uh, for the trial to proceed and a, con and a, uh, and a verdict determined by the court. That point has to be reached. Otherwise, it is going to undermine confidence in the system because people are going to say, look, you know, rich, powerful people can get away with it. They can duck and dive forever. Justice is not done. And that's therefore a problem for the system. The legal system has to be attentive to that. I think certain uh, courts, certain judges have been smart in that sense. And they've, the, the judges over the years have, have joined the dots between uh, the various cases uh, involving the former president. So uh, bit by bit, the net closes on him. Uh, and we're now dealing only with the cases from, from 25 years ago. I mean, there's, there's a whole potentially tranche of new lit, uh, criminality or criminal cases that could be brought against him arising from, from the state capture years. But that that's, seems far off at this stage. Thanks, Richard. I want to um, close off by asking you just to, you made reference earlier of the, the five things necessary for a good president or good leadership. Just run us through those briefly again um, as closing remarks. And then we'll, uh, if there's anyone else that wants to ask a question, you'll be, um, I'll give you one or two um, opportunities to, uh, to do that. So, so one of the reasons I embarked on this book was because of the work I've been doing with corporate leaders, actually. And I started to think a bit more about leadership. What is it? What it isn't it? So on. And, and the, the idea that uh, Mabel and I ended really focusing on was this notion of strategy, which is one of the most overused, misused words in the, in, in, in the English language. People are always saying, you know, I've got to act with strategy. This is very strategic. And often they're just talking about action or plans. Strategy is actually the ability to identify uh, a very uh, important fundamental issue in which there are difficult choices, difficult options to choose between. And then, if you're strategic, having recognized that, you then make a choice. So that's number one. And let's, I mean, a very good example is around the just energy transition. That is a strategic choice. Do you continue with your coal, regardless of trends and, and duties, legal duties, international law duties, or do you make a strategic choice to shift rapidly to renewable energy. And of course, the smartest strategic choices are the ones that are made earlier rather than later, when you're really anticipating what lies ahead. So for example, if South Africa in 2001 or two, let's say, had foreseen 
what was coming from climate and from the world's regulatory system. If South Africa had pivoted away from coal then, we use this example in the book, and committed to re renewable energy, we could be the global leader in re renewable energy at this point. We could be dominant in that space. But we didn't make that strategic choice. In fact, we prevaricated and fussed around for years and years and years, one of the root causes of the ESCOM crisis. So that's number one. Secondly is the ability to execute a strategy, which is where your enforcement, you know, there's no use having a good strategy if you can't execute. The third then is, is decision making uh, and judgment. We just spoke of that earlier. The fourth is political management, because heads of pr presidents are in a political arena. And much of this conversation has been how you manage politics, whether it's the ANC or your colleagues or opposition. So political management. And lastly, again, we discussed this communications, the ability to communicate your vision, to persuade others. So those we think, I mean, there are a million ways of cutting this cake. And there are thousands of books written about leadership. We try to keep it simple and say, what does a president, a political leader need? Those are the five big things they need to be able to good, be good at. The rest is detail. Thank you, Richard. Yes, I think that summarizes it. Um, the book was easy to read, even for someone with, with no political background or you know, um, savvy. Um, and I must be honest with, with, you, with the audience, um, I am never intimidated, but I am extremely intimidated by these two on, on, the, on the couch here. <laughs> Um, so, um, if the, my English wasn't good, it's because of that, I apologize. Um, but I'm happy it's over now, I'm done, okay? Thank you. Um, so, is there anyone else that would like, I see Tiens is here, Tiens may want to ask something. Anyone else that wants to ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, I, the, the one thing I don't understand is if I use the example of the, the Secretary General, Sikili Mbulula, someone who is clearly incompetent, is, and did a terrible job with Minister of Transport. Embarrassing communication, saying he was in Ukraine at the start of the war. What's the internal mechanism that makes him promotable in the ANC rather than to be dismissed? Well, uh, you know, what is the simple answer, I suppose, would be to say the internal democracy of the ANC, but then that speaks to, you know, the state of the ANC at the moment, that the ANC is capable of electing someone like Fikile Mbalula as Secretary General. And I think he demonstrated, if there were any doubters before, during the course of this week, uh, the fact that he's totally unsuited to the, uh, to, the, to the office. He clearly could not understand the debate that happened at the NEC meeting, and therefore came out and, and announced the incorrect conclusion of that debate. Um, and you know that, that's hugely embarrassing if you think of the secretary generals that have gone before in the African National Congress. That we're now sitting someone with someone like a Fikile Mbalula, and you know, uh, you go back to the Duma Nokwes and, and and so on. And you know, you think those are the the the, the, the that should be the gold, gold standard for an ANC secretary general. And but it, it tells you where the ANC is right now. I always had this, these conversations, Lawson, with Madiba, to, to say to him, democracy as we perceive it um, is not the democracy, that uh, the same democracy as that you use in the ANC. I mean, the, um, there's, dem dem there's democracy within the ANC, but there's no democracy in society. I mean, the way we end up with a president or a secretary general, or something, there's no democracy in that for us, ordinary non-ANC members. So um, I think, I think um, uh, that's a good answer from Lawson to your question, sir. Um, there's someone else here? Yes, sir. You alluded to the, the management of the, of the ANC. Um, to what extent is the presidency distinct from the ANC? In other words, to what extent can the president actually make decisions without involving the NEC and, and with their approval? Well, it's an excellent question, really excellent question, because until one has thought about that question and, and figured out the answer, you, you can't really understand what goes on here. Um, so it's, it's, it's critical, and I'm sure you all know this, but, but it's vital for people to appreciate that although we have a president called a president with considerable powers, in the Constitution, he or she is not directly elected. They are elected through the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. So they are effectively a prime minister, actually, not a president. And they serve with the authority of the National Assembly. The National Assembly elected them. The National Assembly can remove them. And in order to win that election in the National Assembly, you have to have the support of your party, the majority party, the, in, 
for the last six elections, the ANC. So therefore, you serve because the ANC has chosen you to serve. And that's why the ANC can, with legitimacy, recall presidents and remove them. And that's nothing wrong with that. That's the system. But it does mean, of course, therefore, that as president, you have to be very careful about what you do in terms of the ANC. And to give one of many examples of that, when uh, Weekend Special, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, uh, Des van Rooyen, uh, appointed on late on Wednesday, fired on Sunday, right? Why? Partly because the market went crazy and serious business leaders came to the president and said, this is a disaster. But also because the ANC top six or the rest of the, the top five said to the president, you didn't consult with us. And he'd failed at that. It was probably his first major blunder. And it showed where his presidency was going, that he'd lost sight of his political moorings. He'd lost sight of a cardinal rule of ANC politics that you have to consult on the biggest issues. And if you don't, you're in trouble. So that was the beginning of the end for Zuma, actually. It took several years for it to play out, but that was his first really big uh, mistake. And it's one of the reasons why Ramaphosa uh, treads carefully. He's been burnt so many times, you know, once bitten, twice shy. And so he, he's very cautious, I think, often because he's trying always to take the ANC with him. Uh, and the, the, the problem is uh, that's okay a lot of the time. But when you're facing big choices and, and ultimately very difficult choices and you need to make a choice, you, you, you've got to have the courage to make those choices. Yes, you consult, but your consultation is saying, Listen, guys, I want your views, but in the end, I am going to make a decision because it is my responsibility as president, elected president by the national. I have to make some choices now, and I will do so. And Mandela made that. Mbeki did that. Cyril doesn't do that. He is, he's, he's tied down by the ANC. They're a dead weight on his decision-making most of the time, it seems to me. Um, uh, Mbeki took it too far the other way. He, he, I think, lost touch of the ANC, and, and in many ways... Uh, you know, that, that's where the notion of two centers of power emerged during his time. Uh, and, and the ANC, in the end, got very cheesed off with that because they felt that the president had become imperial, in a sense, that he, had, he was un disconnected from Latuli House. So you, there's a very delicate balance to be found, and that's why the political management, the number one political management task of our five presidents since 94 has been how, you, how they've managed their own party. They, they haven't had to worry about the opposition. The opposition was within their own party. That's changing, of course. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is we're about to start a new era in which that will matter much less because the ANC is likely to, to be pushed into a minority next year. And then we're into the whole new brave world of uh, coalition politics and a, a greater fragmentation of politics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now there's many questions. Two comments and uh, sort of questions. The, the one is... Uh, on the state of the ANC today, uh, it seems to me that the, the biggest problem, uh, apart from leadership, is the divided nature, deeply divided nature and groupings in the ANC on the basis of two things. A difference in values, i.e. corruption, and a difference in policy, i.e. ideology. Perhaps uh, someone would like to make a comment on that. And then the, the other thing that I think has not had, perhaps because of political correctness, um, the enough exposure on the state of the ANC today is cater deployment. But also, and let me preface this by saying there are excellent people in government, a few, and excellent South Africans of all colors in the private sector. But I think a, a toxic mixture of cater development, a cater deployment on the one hand, and misused, abused employment equity, black economic empowerment, gave rise to an incompetence in government. And I think we don't say, say that enough. Uh, I'm not against affirmative action. It should be there. It should be applied properly. But the way it's been done, and it's been done, is that you can appoint, like Cyril, someone who is just good for him, because he's a cadre. Uh, and, and I'd like to hear whether people agree with that. I think you've, uh, 
you know, you've answered the question because your, your first point is, you know, the, the division between values and ideology or values and, and policy, um, I think is the critical, uh, critical point. And what we see with catered deployment, I mean, I, you know, again, I don't think that catered deployment in and of itself is wrong. It's practiced across the world. It's how you, how you practice that. And if it was to be practiced on the basis of who's the best person to implement an ideological or policy position, it would be fine. But what we see is catered deployment on the basis of values. Who's going to cover up the corruption? Or who's going to facilitate the corruption? That is what Zondo pointed out in the State Capture Commission report as being the problem with catered development, because people were being deployed in order to pursue Zuma's agenda. Yeah, brilliant answer, because um, it links the two, two points you made. But uh, just a, a small addition on your first point, uh, the people I talk to say that within ANC circles now, there is rarely a conversation about policy or ideology. Most of it is about power and about corruption. And, and the debate is usually between people who are honest and people who are not honest. That's the, the major fault line. And I was at the ANC conference in December for my sins and uh, uh, stuck through it. And after the elections had finished, the place literally emptied. So when on the last day they turned finally, um, a mere 36 hours behind schedule, to, to, uh, to look at policy resolutions, most of the delegates had gone because they were there to vote because it's about power and patronage. Another painful example of the hollowing out of a once great organization, political organization, and I think a very fair point about one should always remember that they are very, very good and efficient people in this country. And the problem is that they are not being featured at the moment because of this, um, you know, this um, power play that we see. Anyone else? Yeah, yes. Just like to put the same question we put to Peter uh, Jarpo and Peter de Toy two days ago in the same room with all the vital statistics important for the next year's election. They said people should never vote for the ANC again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How would you to um, share this information with the voters of next year? This important information, you and and all the inf informed, well-informed South African citizens, to get the young people or the new vote voters to make a difference and to, to not give them a, a, another chance. How would we go? Would you use the media? You influence university students. How would you go about that? So, so I'm not a politician. <laughs> not really, not yet. Uh, so, so not I'm, yet. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not. I, I, you know, I would go a, a very long way to avoid telling people how to vote. You know, I think it's South Africans are astute. They can make their own mind up. And I, I certainly resent. Uh, the idea, or reject the idea, that that South African, the South African electorate has been stupid in in the past. Um, people make choices for all sorts of reasons, and and it's you know it's very I think unfortunate when middle class people say to working class people you're dumb because you keep electing this useless government. Um, actually, uh, one has to remember the strengths of the ANC in government, which was to create a welfare state very rapidly in the 90s, and that welfare state until recently has delivered a social wage that has been the difference between poverty, uh, penury, and, and on the one hand, and a, a reasonable, at least, a reasonable uh, living. And so I think people understand that, plus the fact that the ANC um, brought apartheid to an end. So those, that's the legacy. Now, a lot of time has passed now. All the polling shows that uh, the number of people who identify with the ANC, which is the critical question, is de in decline, the younger you are, the less likely you are to identify with the ANC for obvious reasons. As our researcher at Paternoster puts it rather crisply, ANC voters are dying but not being born. So, so there's a demographic shift here. But at the same time, voters are, uh, are being born but not registering to vote. So 9 million, close to 10 million eligible South Africans in 2021 did not register for the local government elections, over 25% of the eligible electorate. Six million of them young, i.e. 29 or under. So the, I think the burning question, to finally answer your question, 
the burning question for the political class is how do you re-engage that group of people? The golden opportunity, if you're in politics now, is to get at least a reasonable portion of those six million to register to vote because they are likely to be open-minded, I think, about where they cast their vote. Malema has failed to get them in. So what is the message? What is the value proposition that will draw them back in? I don't know. And I, I really don't know. And it's the, it's, the, it's the sort of $6 million question for South African politics. If someone can figure out the answer to that question, they will, they will succeed. And someone either from the current parties or from the new parties. I would start with the universities as a vanguard. I would focus because you, you know where they are, you know how to reach them. And if you're a political party, you can go to the campuses and you can campaign and you can try and get uh, young, reasonably uh, well-educated and reasonably privileged South Africans to engage with the issues and hopefully spread the word. That would be where I start. Um, and of course, new entrants to the market, and it's becoming uh, you know, interesting because there's new players. Action SA with their particular populist message. You've got Zongeza Zibi, um, Rise Mzanzi, you've got uh, Mamani coming back as Bosa, that's what it's called. Uh, these guys, we're, we're quite skeptical about these new parties. They, they rarely do more than 1%. Uh, so, but the question is, can they add up to something? Because as you well appreciate, once a majority is lost and no party has a majority, then, as we've seen at local government election, a small party can suddenly start to have disproportionate amounts of power. And so it becomes more interesting. If you've got 2% of the vote and the, and the ANC has 60, you're a tiny player. If the ANC has 43 and you've got 2 or 3%, you might be in the game as the, as the part of the tail that wags the dog, so to speak. Thank you very much, Richard. Richard, is there anyone else that's got a burning question, ma'am? And this is the last question. Um, I wonder whether you are formulating the leadership qualities. I'm not sure that this is needed um, for the coalition politicians. I'm looking at your your five things that are essential for leadership, and it seems to me that some of the um, the great need of South Africa at the moment is how you very rapidly set up the guidelines for those coalition politicians. Thank you. Yeah, interesting question. Uh, and, and I've taken it upon myself for the last few years to, to, to convene a sort of very informal pro bono initiative around coalition politics, recognizing that that's the new terrain, recognizing that coalition politics is difficult and requires different skills. Um, and so, for example, um, one might say that in that context, humility is an important attribute. Because if you are, if you've got 40% uh, of the vote and you've got uh, four, four partners each with 3%, giving you 52, just because you've got 40 doesn't mean you should behave in an arrogant fashion. Far from it. You need to be humble because without the 12, you're nothing. You're not in government. You're not in power. So there are certain parties out there that need to recognize that, that haven't so far recognized that. And, and uh, it's, it has cost the DA in certain places because they haven't handled their partnerships with coalition partners particularly uh, skillfully, it seems to me. And that's one of the things they will need to, to think about uh, and learn. As to whether it fits under our five... Uh, points, I, I don't know, but political management then in coalition politics is about managing your partners and managing the relationships that are required. Trust, simple things like building trust so that you it's, it's stable. More technical things like writing down the agreement and having conflict uh, resolution mechanisms in place so that it doesn't fall apart. And the biggest one is going to be, and this is the biggest, perhaps interesting issue for post-2024, uh, will be uh, a party that is able to put together a coalition that is not just 51, but is more like 70, with several, uh, several um, anchor tenants, <laughs> so to speak. Because if you're reliant on that extra vote that takes you to 51, 
you are so vulnerable, and we've seen the chaos that that's been causing. So that's a very transactional approach to coalition power. It's about simply getting to 51. We have to get away from that. Otherwise, it's going to be very unstable for a long time, and that's not good for anything or anyone. But thank you for your question. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Richard, again, good luck with the book. Um, he's available afterwards for the sale, selling the book. Um, there's some of um, Lawson's. There's your books are there as well? Not, aren't they there? Okay. Um, but Lawson, will, will you will stick around. Just he's to still going to write his. It's going to be an inside account of cricket, South Africa. Oh, of cricket. Yes, of course, we're waiting for that. Um, yes, the book is a so highly recommendable. Um, really, it's a fabulous read. Thank you, Zola. Um, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for coming out and joining us this morning. Thank you very much.